Hello, everybody. Welcome to Chapter 26, Part 1. This is going to be um, where we talk about business cycles and unemployment. So the first thing that we're really going to look at here is this idea of, um, of the business cycle and the various phases that we have. So you're going to see on the next slide that it's easiest to understand when we look at this as a as a graph. So over here you've got your level of real output, so how much stuff is getting made, and then here we have time. Okay, so what you wind up with is basically this line of best fit, but the business cycle is always doing this kind of stuff. Okay, so here you've got your peak, that is where GDP kind of hits its max, and then it starts to go down. Okay, so this is called here a recession. I don't actually love that word, I generally call it contraction. Because a recession is a specific thing with a specific definition, which is two consecutive quarters of shrinking GDP. Um, so after, you after the economy contracts for a while, it will hit its bottom, which we call the trough. Okay, and that's where it basically can't go any, uh, it just stops going down and then it starts to recover. Okay, so then we have this period here, uh, which is called expansion, right, where the economy grows. And then sometimes you will see people call, um, uh, I'm sorry, so this calls it expansion. I don't love to call this expansion. I typically call it recovery at this point because it's hard to imagine, you know, when you are down here that this is really economic expansion. Once you get higher than you were previously, then it makes sense, I think, to call this expansion. But down here, we just kind of call it recovery. Then you get to your other peak again, and it just continues on and on. Now, this becomes your line of best fit, okay? And ultimately, since, you know, depending on what kind of investor you are or whatever, you might care a lot about these various peaks and valleys, or you might only really care about the general line of best fit. So you can see here uh, some various times when we had recessions. Whenever I print off stuff from the Fed, you can see that recessions are always, they'll have gray lines in the graphs. So, um, but this is the important part for a recession. Notice that you've got a decline in real output. GDP shrinks during a recession. So business cycle fluctuations, uh, we don't be agree, believe it or not, with what causes these business cycle fluctuations. Economic shocks are one explanation. So basically a shock comes from anything that we don't anticipate, either a positive or negative shock to the demand side or the supply side. Another explanation is that prices are sticky downwards. So prices willingly go up, but they don't go down. So when, even though uh, demand declines, the question is, you know, when we go from D to D1, what happens to quantity, okay? And if prices are sticky, right, so if we are always going to remain at P, then we go from this Q all the way back to this Q. Whereas if um, we have flexible prices, then Q would remain the same up here, okay? Um, as long as Q is remaining the same, then we're probably going to end up with a much more um, consistent economic situation, whether that's growth or, or just, you know, kind of remaining the same or, or whatever. So what could cause shocks? Well, we know that shocks do happen. Um, so we innovate at an ear. Nobody knows when the next iPhone is going to get created, right? That's just kind of a... It happens when it happens. It's very difficult to predict. We know that productivity changes over time as well. We know, and you haven't learned about monetary factors yet, but monetary policy factors do change. Political events, whether that's, you know, an election or, you know, a, a coup or something like that in some other part of the world, and then just general financial instability within that system. So in the recession of 2012, and if you guys haven't watched the movie uh, The Big Short, you really ought to. It's terrific. Um, both from an entertainment standpoint, but more importantly, it's terrific from a, uh, an economic standpoint. And that's where we learned about what was going on in the housing market and how the housing market winds up bleeding all through other various aspects of the economy. Um, so that's an example of financial instability. Now, um, we know that different 
things are impacted differently. So durable goods are going to be um, things that are affected the most. So capital goods, um, these are things that are purchased for long terms. That a durable good is anything with a three year plus lifespan. So your dishwashers and your cars and things like that um, would be consumer durables. And then capital goods would be like big machinery and all that kind of jazz that businesses are purchasing. Um, and we know that those are, they're, they're fixable. Right? So if something is fixable, then you can choose not to purchase it, uh, at least for a little while. You can just fix it. Right? As opposed to non-durable consumer goods, uh, you know, food and clothing, like when your clothes are worn out, you got to buy new ones. When you know, it's mealtime, you got to eat. So non-durable consumer goods tend to be a little bit less affected by, um, by recession. Now, in terms of unemployment, um, Believe it or not, a huge portion of the working public, or I'm sorry, of the public doesn't work. So you see here, these are slightly old numbers, um, but the point is still made. So of the population, there's a whole bunch that are children or they're in a hospital or a prison or something like that. They are not unemployed. So any of you who don't have a job, um, most of you probably are not unemployed. You aren't working, but since you don't really want to work, you're not unemployed. Then there's this group that's not in the labor force. So these would be like retired people, stay-at-home parents, that kind of thing. Um, they don't want to work. They don't have to work. They're not looking for work. It's no big deal. So this is, you know, almost half of the population. And then you have the employed, which is about half of the population. And then there's the unemployed. So in order to be unemployed, you must be in the labor force, right? In order to be in the labor force, you have to want to work. So if you want to work and you can't find a job and you are trying, you're looking, then and only then are you considered unemployed, which is why I said that a lot of you guys who aren't working, you're not unemployed. You don't count as unemployed because you're not looking for work. So let's figure out the unemployment rate. It is the number of unemployed people divided by the labor force. And notice this here is the labor force. Whoa, that was strange. Um, let me go back to where we were. So this right here is the labor force, okay? And um, this whole portion here is not in the labor force. So the unemployment rate is going to be, in these numbers, 14.3 million divided by 154 million, and that's going to give us a 9.3%, which is what it was, you know, in the year that they were doing this. Right now, it's at record lows. Um, you know, somewhere in the 3 or 4%, depending on how uh, you're calculating things. Now, the criticism of unemployment. So we said that a bunch of you guys are not unemployed. The, you know, if I asked you to raise your hand if you, were look, if you wanted a job, some of you might raise your hands, but if you aren't actively looking, then you're not counted. Likewise, there are probably some people out in the world, well, there are definitely some people out in the world, who um, would like to work, more than they are. So they are part-time workers, but that's involuntary. They would prefer to be working. But part-time workers and full-time workers are counted the same way. They're employed. Then there's this group called discouraged workers. These are people who would like to work. They used to be looking for work. They couldn't find anything, so they gave up. Those people, since they are no longer actively seeking employment, are technically not unemployed. And this is a really tricky thing um, to figure out how many of these people actually exist um, because it can be difficult to tease out if somebody really wants to work or if, you know, they would work if they needed, you know, if a really good opportunity came along but they don't have to. You know, things like that make it very complex. Now, this is uh, where it gets kind of definitional and important. So frictional unemployment this is where people sort of voluntarily stop uh, with one job because they're going to switch to another one. Typically, it's uh, to seek out a better opportunity and it works out just fine. In a situation where the economy is really good, frictional unemployment tends to rise because everybody's confident that they can get a new job. When the economy is bad, frictional unemployment tends to fall because you don't voluntarily leave your job unless you are pretty convinced that you can get a new one. So Cyclical unemployment is when the economy goes down, so we go back to those business cycles. Cyclical unemployment is the kind of unemployment that happens here, right? If we were back where we were at the peak, then you would be employed, right? And once it comes back up, 
then these people will be rehired, right? Uh, but for the time being, because we're in an economic downturn, these people lose their job. That is cyclical unemployment. These are typically layoffs as opposed to people who lose their job because they're bad at it or because they are now structurally unemployed. This means that demand for whatever people did goes away. So, you know, the politicians always talk about, um, you know, creating jobs and what are you going to do with manufacturing and what are you going to do with, um, with miners and things like that. Well, the argument is, is there demand for people to be mining coal any longer? If people don't really want to buy coal because natural gas is cheaper and cleaner, then what can you do to bring back that coal job? Um, if nobody wants to buy coal, then there is no derived demand from labor. You remember that from last semester. So make sure that you understand these three types of unemployment. All right, now, uh, full employment is this complex thing that we have to figure out. How much, how many people are employed, how many people should be employed, etc. So for that, we have this thing called the NRU, the natural rate of unemployment, or sometimes it's called the full employment level of unemployment. What this means is, basically, the United States economy would really struggle if every single person had a job that wanted one. Because if my business is growing and the only way I can get somebody to come and work for me is to hire somebody away from somebody else, then wages are going to have to go up, which means prices are going to go up, which means that we're going to have a whole bunch of inflation. Okay, so we, so that means the economy is so hot and growing so fast that we worry about inflation. So we don't really want unemployment to be much lower than it is right now. You want it to be low enough that wages do rise because you do want rising wages over time, but you don't want it to be so low that we wind up with the spirals of inflation. So the full employment level of unemployment, which we, which most economists would say is around four, four and a half, maybe three and a half, as low as three and a half, maybe as high as five percent. These are the people that you want to be that the macro economy, obviously not any individuals, but that the macro economy wants to be unemployed so that when a job comes open, it can be filled by somebody moving up as opposed to just stealing people away in lateral moves. Um, obviously, this changes as you know more women enter the market, as teenagers uh, and their willingness to work changes over time. Um, it's easier to get jobs because of like Indeed.com and all the online stuff. Um, and then obviously, whenever you have public policy changes, that changes things too. So when it is more or less, when, when the government does more or less to support people who are unemployed, that's going to change uh, people's desire to be unemployed to some extent. Now, the GDP gap is what we talk about when we're looking at the cost of unemployment. So we know that everybody who's unemployed could be producing something. So our actual GDP is what we could produce if everybody were employed. The potential, uh, I'm sorry, the potential GDP is what we would produce if everybody was employed. And the actual GDP is what we really do produce. Now this can be positive or negative. So if there's a lot of unemployment, then our potential GDP will be bigger than our actual and the number will be negative. But if the economy is really uh, going along well, then we can have a situation where our actual GDP is greater than our potential because a whole bunch of people were pulled into um, were pulled into the market who don't really want to be there, or people are working a ton of overtime or something like that. We can be producing more than our potential. That can exist for a while, but ultimately it will it will wind up going down. Now there's this thing, Okun's law, which states that whenever we have a one percent uh, cyclical unemployment, we get a two percent GDP gap. So if we have a 3% cyclical unemployment rate, then that would give us a 6% GDP gap. It's just doubled. Okay, now, once again, notice that it is cyclical unemployment because structural unemployment is very difficult to deal with. What can you do to give somebody a job if whatever skill they have is not desired by the economy? That's a tricky question. So here we see um, there are periods of time where we have, you know, uh, where we've got a, uh, a, a negative gap, so this would be during, um, you know, some recessions and stuff, and then, well, not recessions, but uh, but we weren't, 
fully, you know, we were we were growing, but we weren't all the way there. Then uh, in the very late 90s to early 2000s, prior to the dot-com boom, which is what we see here, uh, we end up with a positive GDP gap where the economy was smoking along so well that we actually were producing more uh, than our potential GDP, and that lasted for a while. And then we have this huge negative gap when the Great Recession comes. So here is our unemployment rate. Um, you can see that it spikes up, uh, then it goes down, then the recession comes, it spikes up, it goes down, the recession comes, it spikes up. And that's just really what's kind of happened over time. The numbers would look pretty similar if we stretched back to the 50s or the 20s or whatever. Know that the uh, burden of, the burden of um, unemployment is not shared equally. Okay, so different occupations uh, have very different unemployment rates. Um, there are different unemployment rates uh, across different ages. Um, you know, white people and people of color tend to have different uh, unemployment rates. Men and women have different unemployment rates. Obviously, people, you know, you're, the more educated you are, typically the lower unemployment you're going to have. And then there's this whole thing with the duration of unemployment. So if you've been unemployed for a while, uh, over six months, it's much more difficult to get a job than if you are unemployed for less than six months. You know, your skills start to atrophy and potential employers probably start to think, well, what was this person doing, you know, for the last, uh, for the last while? So if you are unemployed, there's a, a real decision to be made about taking, you know, holding out for that really good job that you want, that you're qualified for, versus taking something kind of below what you're qualified for simply so that you do not remain unemployed for too long and start to be perceived as being unemployable. So you can pause here and take a look at some of the different unemployment rates. This is just the numbers put forth with what we talked about. Notice that uh, we've got uh, two different years, 07 and 09. Um, now, when we are unemployed, there's, there's a nice list of problems that come along with that level of unemployment. So pause and read through. We talked about a lot of that in the GDP article. Then we've got various um, unemployment rates across the world. You can pause and look at that. Um, but then now we're going to move on to inflation. And this is going to be the subject of our next video. So we will stop here. Um, thanks a lot.